welcome everyone. We'll be talking about um, workflows, fully compliant open workflows. What does that mean? Do we already have that? What do we find important? And this really started, you may know this picture, this was actually a picture born at, uh, at Forest two years ago, at our poster. I'll stay here, so I'll be in the picture. Where this is where our work started, where we did an inventory of innovative tools and platforms. Not even open tools and platforms, innovative tools and platforms. And how that changes, how the use of those tools and platforms, how that changes scholarly communication, what we can see about how researchers are changing their ways, making use of these platforms or not, what that signifies. So we want to talk about that some more today. Because what would an open workflow look like? Would these tools together make up an open workflow? Would you all consider all these tools to be acceptable in an open workflow? Or not? No. <laughs> There are many different criteria, many different choices. And that's what we want to talk about. And those criteria, a lot of people have been thinking about this. A lot of people have been thinking about different aspects of open scholarly communication. There are a lot of charters and guidelines. And can they help us in these choices? A lot of people here in the room have also been working on this. And what we did, we took three of these. The scholarly commons principles that, full disclosure, we've been working on that ourselves within Force 11. There are a lot of people in the room who've been working on that with us. The principles of open scholarly infrastructure from Cameron Nylon, Gav Builder, Jennifer Lynn, and uh, the recent initiative, the joint, the joint roadmap of open science tools that brought together a lot of um, people, organizations, in this case, not for profit, providing open source tools that those are their criteria, there may be more. Scholarly Commons principles, they, uh, some of their, their uh, principles, their criteria, are about really research output, making that open, fair and citable. Also about facilitating open participation. Provenance, no intrinsic rankings, some more things. Open scholarly infrastructures also talk specifically about governance, about financial sustainability, but also about stakeholder governance, non-discriminatory governance, all different criteria that people used. So what we did for this exercise to make this tangible, to make this workable, is we reduced them to five criteria. Maybe. And that, of course, uh, there's a lot, of, lot to be said about why these five. Um, well, because we only have half an hour. <laughs> and we only have this amount of space on our poster. But we also think that these might be some of the more crucial ones, and might also be some of the ones uh, on which there are different opinions. Different opinions here in the room, but also different opinions, <clears throat> especially between researchers and between advocates for open or, or organizations. Um, so we selected these five open source, non-profit open license data, um, free or no cost for end users and stakeholder governed. And you could think of them from a researcher perspective and look at really f functionality, can I use this? Does this make my life easier or does it make my research better or does it, this facilitate what I want to do? And some of them might be more ethical, more high over, but still important in, in, in the longer term. Although, is it important? Well, actually, that, that's up to you. Um, if you think first at a, a little bit at a higher, a higher perspective, these are also the, um, the, the questions that are very important for organizations supporting science. So for instance, outside this room, I, uh, when we are in, in Europe, I should not mention the P word, but I can use the P word here. So for instance, Plan S, you may have heard about that, an initiative by funders. They have to think about what kind of open platforms and, uh, and journals, do we want to support, want, do we want to fund, do we want to foster that they are being created? So they have to look at these questions. Another one also from Europe, sorry about that, is um, the um, Open Science um, Monitor, where they really have to check, have to think about what do we want to measure? 
and how do we want to measure that? Do we want to, that monitor itself to be open? How, does this, how do these questions relate to those, um, to those real life uh, applications? Another one might be Cielo in their, uh, in their next steps when they want to, uh, to improve or, or, or change or uh, recreate their, their platforms. Do they, want, do they look at these kind of criteria? So that's a high, at a higher level. But especially, of course, in the end, it's about individuals and researchers thinking about how do I want to work, what, do, what kind of tools do I, want to, um, uh, do I want to use in that. And to get you a little bit active, because you had the lunch and we don't want you to, uh, to, to fall asleep, we want you to talk about the one criterion that is on your table and take five, up to five minutes for that. Uh, around the table and answer these two, these two questions. Which tools and platforms did you know, or that uh, a few we will show, comply, and which don't? And how important is the criterion on your table for open workflows and open and scholarly commons? Do you think that it's, we should look at that at all? Um, and in thinking about tools that might or might not comply, you've got a a whole bunch of them here, but you can also think about the ones you perhaps uh, are uh, fostering yourself, have created yourself, or using yourself. Um, so but do that related to that one criterion that's on your table. So take five minutes for that. This is always an awkward point to break up all these discussions. I would happily just leave this and let you continue your conversation because that's, this is so important also at this conference. Having said that, we'll take it back. Um, we are, of course, very interested in the tools and platforms that you thought about that might be compliant with your specific criterion. And maybe we can do a little bit more conversation about that later on also at our poster, but for now I want to ask you a different question. At your tables, which tables were in agreement about the importance of your specific criterion? <laughs> Can you raise your hands if your table was in agreement? We've got a... <laughs> yeah? So some of them, a lot of hesitations. So perhaps that illustrates also the differences of opinion about this, the different priorities perhaps also reflecting your different stakeholder roles, to use that word, the different where you're coming from and what your goal is. So to make that a little bit more visible in the room, what we'd like to ask you to do something else, and this do electronically. So if you have a device, your smartphone, your, your laptop, please go to this link. And it's a Google form with exactly those same criteria. And please select there. Which of those five criteria, there may be more than one, which of those five you think are important in deciding what are open tools? Deciding of an open workflow, what criteria are most important? Okay. Okay, thank you. As technology goes, best laid plans and all that. We will share the full results of this uh, polling exercise online, we'll include it in the, in the presentation, because that didn't work. You all responded, we got a lot of responses, there's something wrong in the Google form, I really apologize for that, but I want to show you, still want to show you what this could look like. So depending on the choices that you make, more other tools are compliant, other tools might fit in such a workflow. So for instance, only based on only just open source, you've got a selection here. If you include that it needs to be stakeholder governed, you get another selection. And so you can play with that. If you in insist that it needs to be non-profit, you get other selections. And again, this is still a selection from everything that's out there. So you can see here what your choice is what, the, what your criteria mean for what's available to use. And that, of course, raises more 
Other questions? Because these openness uh, criteria are all very nice and very important. But think of a researcher behind her desk or in the field somewhere um, really wanting to perform. They might have some other more practical, down-to-earth questions and requirements for tools and platforms they use. And at first, just include anything that's out there and not just first select on openness or on stakeholder governance or things like that, but select on does it work in my OS? Is it easy to learn? Uh, for some uh, goals, does it, does it have a, a high performance? Is it, is it fast? Um, some privacy uh, concerns might come into play when, uh, when you are selecting, uh, selecting a tool. So this is really from a researcher perspective, and we should always be, be aware of that, and that that in, in many cases may come first. Of course, the awareness on all the other, on the openness uh, criteria is very important, but we can't shovel this aside and say, well, just look at the openness characteristics. Um, all of this, you, we, we have done that here right now, and we will share the full results, but you can do that at our poster at number, uh, at number eight. You can do that at home. We will share these, uh, these slides so you can, so you can e easily follow, uh, follow the links. Um, and really think hard about what is the consequence of those choices that I make. And also use that when you're uh, communicating with other researchers or when you are with different stakeholders in the room. And, and make that explicit. Put that, really put that on the table. And what's also important, of course, is the story behind this. We, we selected some of these criteria from, from the bigger frameworks uh, that, that got a lot of thinking in it, but they are not holy, they are not permanent forever. Um, so please also give feedback on those frameworks. Um, there are many options, of course, uh, to do that. You can join the JROS people, you can talk to Cameron in the room about the uh, um, um, Open Scholarly Infrastructures um, uh, paper. Um, you can talk to Scholarly Commons people. If you are interested in Scholarly Commons, there's a small leaflet outside where you can really see all of, all of these principles. So the feedback on this continuously is, um, is very important. And for now, it's important. So if you have these tools, this selection of tools, based on your set of criteria, then you've got another question. The question is, do these tools really cover the entire workflow? Or are there still gaps, gaps for certain functionality? For instance, really for, for writing, or for uh, sharing protocols, or whatever. Or are there disciplinary gaps? Do you say, well, this is all nice and OK for life science, but I'm in history, and I've got a little bit different type of working? Um, Another question is, do they work well together? Because in their, in, um, separately, they might comply with all these criteria. But if they don't communicate with, uh, with other tools in other, work, in other phases of that workflow, uh, we've got a problem. So uh, do they uh, adhere also to the technical norms? And finally, a question that we could, uh, we could ask is, are, and that, that's a very important one, are these tools good enough to not only attract the early adopters, the early majority, people here in the room, a uh, lot of your friends, but really also the great majority of, uh, of researchers. Are they attractive enough for the mainstream? And this is also, you can ask us any question, but this is also our, question, our three questions here for you now and at, at, this, at this conference that we would like to get uh, like to get feedback on. So based on these criteria, if you create such a workflow, is that something that you could take out and go to research and say, well, this is realistic. This is what you can do. And by the way, it's even better, and it saves you time, and it saves you money, and it makes the, the, the whole thing at a, at a system level tick. Um, so that, that's, that's an important question. We should not only be content with a nice workflow ourselves, but it, it should be something that you can uh, go out with. Um, so that's all from us. Uh, 
please, if you have answers to the, these questions, or if you want to raise other questions on whether this is a useful approach, or a useful way of looking at, uh, at tools and uh, what we can do over the next, uh, next few years, then please step forward or ask for the mic. Any questions, remarks? Yes. Is there a mark? Hold on. Yeah. Sorry. Thanks. So what's left if you toggle every criteria in the categories? Do we have one option per category? There are some left, actually. No? Quite a bit, actually. It was nice. We were scoring this yesterday. And by the way, these criteria and the scoring, I'm pretty sure that we can have a conversation with every one of you in the room that is responsible for any of these tools and platforms on each of them. So please also come to us, because it's part of it is subjective. But when we were scoring this, we, we got quite a few full houses that we were really happy to see. Although you might need this, because if you look at this uh, table right now, there's nothing for writing left when you tick all these five, so you might need a pen. <laughs> Thank you, folks. Uh, this was a fun game. Um, uh, Dario from the Wikimedia Foundation here. Um, I just wanted to, to highlight the discussion that we had at the, uh, the workshop, uh, JROS, because I think it's a useful way of seeding further discussion here. It was about one specific condition of those that you listed there, and it's the nonprofit condition. So um, there are, I'm working for the Wikimedia Foundation, and we're, our projects are community owned, but there are many other projects that work differently. And I think the status of that condition is specifically tricky. Um, I've been having conversations with multiple people working on projects that were originally open source and community governed and then for sustainability issues, ended up trying to figure out ways to survive in different ways. Plum actually started in that way, I believe. Uh, there, are many, there are many examples of projects starting away and that end up in a different situation because of sustainability issues and because they have a community. So I think this is a specifically tricky and complex question that I'd like uh, all of us to think about very seriously because it's, uh, it's not an easy one to answer. No, absolutely, and thank you. That's a, that's a really nice. Uh, that's absolutely true. You really useful comment. Also related to to sustainability. I should also say that these are not, per definition, the ones that are that we would definitely recommend. These are ones for discussions. Oh. Could you share a little bit more about? Uh, uh, sort of the judging criteria that you use for community governed because it yeah. was interesting the projects that went that sort of hit at that point and the ones that are still on there so I'd love to to hear a little bit more about that yeah that was a, uh, the hardest one to score also there there are some that are really uh, a really hard criteria was whether on the website or we just know that decision making is really done by multiple stakeholders, like things like Crossref or Git. There are many, many tools that have advisory boards comprised of really representatives from different organizations. And then it's, it depends, okay, what's the role of that advisory board? Do they just advise, but are the final decisions made by a smaller group? Or is there a governing board comprised of multiple stakeholders? And we don't, we don't have the answer. I think we're pretty strict, but that was really something we discussed, like where should, we, where should you draw the line? And again, I don't think there is any one good model or any one bad model. And having such, a, such an advisory board comprised of many different groups is definitely a very good thing. And uh, I, I, I would like to add to that, regardless of whether something is stakeholder governed or not, it is very important to have information on that 
transparently available somewhere. So if you have an advisory board, it should say a little bit about what is the role of that advisory board and how serious is their advice being taken. Um, and we were very pleasantly surprised that there are a few of these organizations, few of these tools that really have extensive information on how their governance is organized and who is responsible for what. And that's a very important, I think. Not only for us to make this exercise easier, but in real life. Okay, thank you very much. Round of applause.